Hello, my name is Bill Robbins. In this video module, I'm going to discuss thyristors, sometimes called SCRs, which stands for Semiconductor, semiconductor Control Rectifier or Silicon Control Rectifier. I'm going to discuss the following topics. The construction of the SCR and its IV characteristics, a discussion of the physical operation of SCRs, their switching behavior, DVDT and DIDT limitations that we must impose on thyristors to keep them from failing, and finally, some considerations on how we can drive SCRs and the design of the drive circuit. Going to the first topic on the next slide, this shows a vertical cross-section of a typical so-called phase control thyristor, which is intended for 60 hertz applications. The unique part about it is it's a four-layer structure. There is a P-type layer close to the anode, followed by an N-minus layer, which is lightly doped and functions as a drift region, a moderately doped P region, and then finally the heavily doped N-plus region where the cathode is connected. In conjunction with this four-layer structure, there are three PN junctions that we need to be aware of. I've labeled them J1, J2 and J3, and we'll discuss them in more detail in the next few slides. The typical doping levels and uh, thicknesses of the different layers are shown in the drawing. The thickness of the first N minus layer is very lightly doped, 10 to the 13th to 10 to the 14th, and its thickness can range from a few tens of microns to upwards of a thousand microns, depending on what the rated breakdown voltage is. Down at the bottom, I show two different metallization patterns for the upper surface where the gate and the cathode electrodes are. For a phase control thyristor, shown on the left-hand side, we have a relatively small central gate surrounded by a much larger cathode area. Whereas on the right, for a so-called inverter grade or faster switching thyristor, we have a much more ingitated, interdigitated uh, gate electrode so that the average distance between the center line of a, of a gate electrode and the adjacent center line for the electrode of the uh, cathode are much shorter than they are in the phase control thyristor. The IV characteristic of a thyristor is shown on the next slide and it is most unusual compared to the IV characteristic we've been looking at so far. In the reverse direction, where the anode is negative and the cathode is positive, it looks like the reverse bias behavior of any standard PN junction. If we go to a high enough voltage, we get to impact ionization, and thus we have large currents at large voltages. But in the forward direction, there is, a, there is apparently two different operating regimes. In the forward blocking state, it looks like a reverse bias PN junction. High voltages, very small currents. But we also have the forward on state where we have low voltages and much higher currents, much like a forward bias PN junction, and connecting them is a negative resistance region. We'll get, discuss the physical operation that leads to this kind of behavior in the next slide or two. The SCR can be triggered from the forward blocking state to the on state by means of a gate current pulse, but once the device is on, we can't turn it off by means of gate control. The external circuit must force the SCR off which means the external applied voltage must make the anode negative and the cathode positive in order to turn off the thyristor. Current levels can range anywhere from a few tens of amps to several thousand amps depending on the capabilities of the thyristor which one has picked. Even at several thousand volts, the on-state voltage will be on the order of two to four or five volts. Blocking voltages are on the order of 5 to 8 kilovolts and in some cases even higher. The other parameters defined on the uh, IV curve I think are fairly self-evident. VB0 is a so-called breakover voltage, which is the voltage at which the uh, device is rated to withstand uh, when the device is off. Any voltages that exceed any applied voltages that exceed the breakover voltage may inadvertently trigger the device on when you don't want it to be on. The breakover current is the current at which the device breaks over when you're at the breakover voltage. It's typically a few tens to a few hundreds of milliamps, depending on the particular thyristor.
The holding voltage and the holding current represent the minimum combination of voltages and currents that the device has when still in the on state. If the voltage or current drop below those values, it will automatically switch, admittedly in a very slow fashion, from the on state to the blocking state. These voltages are typically, holding voltages are typically on, your, on the order of a volt and the holding currents are typically only a little bit larger than the breakover current. Maximum operating temperature for the device is about 170, I mean 125 degrees centigrade. That's limited by the fact that at temperatures above that, the breakover voltage begins to decrease. The circuit symbol for a thigh wrister is shown on the lower left-hand side. Looks like a diode symbol with an extra terminal added uh, on the uh, bottom side near the cathode for the uh, gate electrode. In order to explain the operation of the device, the next slide shows a so-called four-layer model for a thyristor. This is a one-dimensional model. Starting from the anode, we have the P1 layer, N1, P2, and N2. The cathode is connected to the bottom of this stack, and the gate is connected to the P2 layer. And again, I've designated the three PN junctions, J1, J2, and J3. Corresponding to that is a two-transistor equivalent circuit for this four-layer stack. The upper transistor Q1 is a PNP transistor whose emitter is the P1 layer, whose base is the uh, N1 layer, and whose emitter is the P2 layer. The lower transistor Q2 is an NPN transistor whose collector is the N1 layer, whose base is the P2 layer, and whose emitter is the uh, N2 layer. In the forward blocking state, these transistors are technically in the active region, though they're conducting only very small currents. They're in the active region because both base emitter junctions are forward biased, or that is the emitter base junction of the PNP is forward biased and the junction J3, the base emitter junction of the NPN is forward biased, and the common J2 junction, which functions as the uh, collector base junction, is reverse biased. Now this forward blocking state is a stable state for these two transistors, even though they're technically in the active region because their current gains are very small, or equivalently their so-called base transport factors alpha are much less than unity. If these transistors were good transistors with uh, betas greater than one, this would be an unstable mode of operation. And the slightest perturbation, if you were somehow able to get the two transistors in their active region, the slightest perturbation would either push them into cutoff or into saturation. And you can verify this by simply looking at the circuit and thinking about it critically for a few minutes. We can use the evers mall equations to describe these two transistors in the active region. The collector current is for the PNP transistor is minus alpha 1 IE1 plus IC01 and a similar one for the NPN transistor. The IC0 is a, essentially a leakage current uh, between the collector and base terminals when the emitter is open and you have the junction, collector base junction reverse biased. So these currents are quite small. We can also use the equations to relate the terminal currents to the uh, transistor currents. I sub A is the emitter current for, for the PNP transistor and so on. And if I use Kirchhoff's current law for one of the transistors, this combination of three equations that I've gathered together here can be solved and we can obtain the equation which I'm showing here, which is the anode current as a function of the gate current and the transistor parameters, IC01 and 2 and the alphas of the transistors. The thing to note is, in particular, is the denominator. If the sum of alpha 1 plus alpha 2 is much less than 1, we're in the blocking state, and with zero gate current, the anode current is only the leakage currents that we were talking about, and so the device is truly in a blocking state. However, if the alphas can change their values and approach unity, then we're going to be at breakover, as I showed on the IV curve, and we're about to enter that negative resistance region where the transition from the forward blocking state to the forward on state occurs. Now this two transistor model doesn't, isn't valid in the uh, 
negative, resi negative resistance region, but at least it points out the important parameter, which is the sum of alpha 1 plus alpha 2. If we can explain on a physical basis how these alphas can change, we've essentially shown how we trigger the device on from the blocking state to the on state. Going to the next slide, the purpose of this slide is to explain that operation. In the upper right-hand corner, I show the four-layer model again, but I've also shown the depletion region of junction J2 and how it behaves as we either increase the anode to cathode voltage or, more importantly, we put in a gate current going into the gate of the thyristor. With no applied gate current and only moderate anode to cathode voltages, we have a relatively thin depletion region for junction J2. But now if I input a gate current, I am going to inject electrons from the N2 layer into the P2 layer, exactly as we do when we put base current into an NPN transistor. Those carriers, excess electrons, diffuse across the P2 region, the base of the NPN transistor, and arrive at the edge of the depletion region. The depletion region's high electric field accelerates those electrons across the depletion region and into the N1 layer. Those electrons that have been collected and pushed into the N1 layer represent additional negative charge, and that has to be compensated by some positive charge. Part of that compensation is achieved by a widening of the depletion region into the N1 layer, that is, a widening of the J2 depletion region to uncover more negatively, I mean, more positively charged donors. At the same time, there's also an extension of that depletion region into the uh, base of the NPN transistor. If you remember much about uh, the operation of a transistor, particularly in the active region, the beta of the transistor and correspondingly the base transport factor alpha are a function of the effective base width. The narrower the base width, the larger the alphas and the larger the betas of the transistors. Well, as we increase the depletion layer width, we are narrowing the uh, neutral region uh, of, of both bases and thus we're narrowing the effective base width. So this is the mechanism by which we increase the uh, alphas of the transistors. Simultaneously to the injection of electrons, as extra negative charge gets into the N1 layer, we also partially compensate for that char additional charge by attracting holes from the P1 layer into the N1 layer. And those holes then undergo the same basic transport as the electrons did, that is the holes drift across the P2, I mean the N1 region, get to the depletion region of junction J2, are accelerated and collected into the base of the uh, PNP transistor, that is the P2 layer. That represents additional positive charge that must be compensated, and that is partially done by, again, increasing the depletion region thickness further, and at the same time attracting more electrons from the N2 layer. This process involving both holes and electrons is called a double injection process, and it's a regenerative one. Once it gets started, it will carry forward as long as we maintain enough gate current for, enough, for a long enough period of time, and as a result, we will complete, we will fill both the N1 and the P2 layers with lots of excess carriers. And in terms of the terminology of the transistors, as we increase the uh, width of the J2 depletion region, we are increasing the betas of these two transistors in this model. And when the betas approach unity, we are at the breakover condition. And as I've already indicated, transistors in this configuration that have decent betas is an unstable situation, and depending on which way you are pushing the circuit initially, once they enter the active region with decent betas, the momentum that pushed them into the region where the betas are larger than one will continue. And since we started from essentially these transistors with poor betas, and the betas are now becoming larger than one, these transistors will be pushed across the depletion, I mean across the uh, active region and into saturation, where both Q1 and Q2 are in their on states, and all three junctions are forward biased. Once the MOSFETs are in the on state, 
we need to describe what the uh, on state looks like. First of all, we need to understand once it's in the on state, the, trans the thyristor is latched up and we can't turn it off. And this slide indicates the reason why. When we first turn on the thyristor, we're pushing a lot of current in a fairly narrow region and it spreads out as time proceeds to fill up the, in, the entire region underneath the uh, cathode diffusion. Now when we go to turn it off, we draw a negative gate current. And so what we're trying to do is, particularly the current that is flowing near the periphery between the P2 and the uh, N, and N2 layers, we want to bend the current around as indicated. And in particular, further in, we want to bend it like so. That's the process by which we're starting to turn, try to turn off the thyristor under gate control. The problem is, particularly for phase control thyristors, we have a fairly wide cathode area. And the currents that are near the center line, which I might say is perhaps uh, right in here, the current has to traverse on a fairly long parallel region, parallel to the surface. And that induces a voltage drop, as I've indicated here. And similarly, a voltage drop on the other adjacent area, like this. I've shown a resistance there, which is so, sort of called a spreading resistance. The net effect is, I have a lateral voltage drop, which means the voltage at this point from the boundary of the P2 in to layer to the cathode is higher than it is at this point near the uh, edge of the cathode region. That means there's going to be more current flow along this, under the center line and parallel to the center line and near the center line than near the uh, edge. This is a so-called current crowding phenomena, and what it means is it's so severe that we don't have much influence on the voltage along the center at the center line, as I've indicated. And so we don't have the ability to cause the current to uh, bend around, even around the center line and out to the gate. As a consequence, we don't have enough leverage to turn the device off. And this is the reason, this is the mechanism for latch up. In the on state, the device looks like a uh, PIN diode in its on state. What occurs is the following. We model the thyristor. Here is the anode on the right hand side, the cathode. I'm showing here the uh, excess carrier density in each of the regions. In the N2 and uh, P1 regions, we're so heavily doped that there isn't anywhere near as many excess carriers as there is uh, carriers due to the doping. But in the uh, N1 and P2 layers, as I've shown, the excess carrier densities are significantly higher than the doping level. For example, in the P2 layer, I might call that uh, N sub A2 for the uh, accepted doping density in the P2 region. In the N1 region, the doping levels are even smaller. So the excess carrier densities can be uh, orders of magnitude in those two regions larger than the doping densities. And so we have heavy conductivity modulation just as we do in a forward biased PIN diode. So the total on state voltage is going to be the sum of the voltage drop across the drift region plus the three junction drops. Now all three of the junctions are forward biased. Here is the, volt, the junction drop across J1. This is the drop across junction J2 and this is the drop across junction J3. So if you add those up, we have VJ1 minus VJ2 plus VJ3. All of them are going to be very similar in magnitude, differing by only a few tenths of a volt at most, on the order of a volt or so. And then we have the on-state voltage, the uh, drift region voltage, which will be on the order of a couple of volts or so, depending on the current level and the type of thyristor that we've picked. So overall, one expects the on-state voltage drop to be in the neighborhood of 2 to 4 or 5 volts, depending on the current levels. Now, like any switch mode type of device, we need to be concerned about the uh, turn-on and turn-off transients. With a thyristor, I'm going to 
model it in a circuit where it's most typically used, and that would be a perhaps a three-phase circuit. So I have three-phase voltages, VA, VB, and VC, and to each is connected an inductor and a series thyristor feeding into a common load, the load being modeled as a uh, current source. Each of the thyristors can only be turned on for a maximum of 120 degrees per cycle. That is 120 out of 360, or about a third of a period. The period in which a given thyristor can be turned on is when it is the largest of the three phase voltages. And I've indicated for phase A the region where, or the time if you like, where thyristor A can be turned on. For purposes of discussing when we turn it on, when the phase voltage A is becoming right at the instant it becomes the largest, that will be our time origin, and we can delay with respect to that time origin when we actually turn on the thyristor and that is a so-called turn-on uh, delay time or trigger angle. And then it remains on for the rest of that 120 degrees, and then it gets turned off as VB becomes the largest of the phase voltages, and so on. So each of these three thyristors would be triggered with the same trigger angle if we're trying to maintain a constant amount of power to the load. We will use the gate current as the uh, marker, time marker, with which we relate the uh, buildup of the anode current and the decrease of the uh, an anode to cathode voltage. We assume that we turn on the uh, gate current very fast compared to any of the other transients, so I'm using a step function waveform. There's a certain amount of delay before the uh, anode current begins to r rise. That's the turn on delay time. We have to put enough excess carriers in there before we begin to see any significant uh, change in the anode current. And then the anode current rises at a rate DIF by DT, which is usually controlled by the external circuit, usually because of the series inductance and the magnitude of the applied voltage. Once, at the same, at the same time the current begins to rise, the voltage begins to drop. And during the current rise time interval, the current completes its transient and arrives at the full on-state voltage, but the anode to cathode voltage has not reached its final on-state value. The rate at which it continues to drop slows down considerably during this time piece of S, which stands for the plasma spreading time. This is the time needed for the excess carriers to spread laterally from the edge of the diffusion region to the center line of the diffusion region for that uh, diffusion where the cathode is connected. And this can be on the order of several tens of microseconds depending on the capabilities of the thyristor. The bigger thyristor and the bigger its current carrying capacity, the longer it's going to take for that plasma spreading time. We also have to be interested in the turnoff of the thyristor, and that's shown in the next slide. As I've already indicated, the thyristor behaves pretty much like a PIN diode in a lot of respects. And so during the thyristor turnoff, we expect to see what current waveforms and voltage waveforms that are reminiscent of the turnoff of a PIN diode. At T is equal to zero, the uh, voltage across the anode to cathode is crossing zero going negative. The anode current then begins to decrease at a constant rate, DIR by DT. That's going to be fixed by the external circuit, most likely. Crosses zero after a time T1 and goes negative. It has a peak negative value that's reminiscent of the reverse recovery current of a PIN diode. And after that peak current, the current then decays down to zero or to some marker point, such as one quarter of the peak reverse recovery current, or one tenth, whatever definition suits our particular needs. The anode to cathode voltage does not drop very much from its on-state value until we get to the peak negative current. At that point, there's not enough stored charge in the uh, two base regions to sustain this uh, positive voltage, and so very quickly the junction J2 can, I mean the blocking junctions can become reverse biased, and so we have a very rapid increase 
in the anode to cathode voltage. Perhaps an over voltage will develop if we have a uh, fairly rapid decay in this initial area of the current from the peak reverse recovery current magnitude and it then will gradually decay down to the reverse bias value dictated by the external circuit. Now we have to be careful and make sure that this over voltage doesn't exceed the uh, ratings of the device when it's reverse biased. Because of the mechanisms that I've described and how the device operates, there are some limitations that we need to be aware of. For example, when the device is turned on, we must keep the rate at which the anode current rises below some maximum limit specified by the manufacturer. The problem is the following. Initially, the turned on area where the excess carriers are is going to occur in this area that I've shown shaded, which is near the boundary between the P2 region and the N2 region. Because we're injecting at carriers in this direction, particularly in the vicinity of the uh, gate cathode. If the current rises too quickly, we're going to have a very large current held to being conducted in a relatively small area and the instantaneous power dissipation can be too large for the device to safely handle. So we want to control the rate of, at which that current rises so that the instantaneous power dissipation doesn't get too large. That is, we want to gradually, we want to keep the, we want the uh, turned on region to grow as rapidly as possible, but we don't want to overstress that region by having too large a current, and that's the origin for the uh, DIDT limit. Typically what we do as we turn on this device is initially we're going to have a very large and fast rising gate current pulse, but it's only going to last for a relatively short period of time so that we get the device turned on and the uh, excess carrier starting to spread laterally. At that point, the current is probably getting substantially large and so we need to back off on the gate current so that we're not uh, turning it on too quickly and so then we'll want to have this lower value which we maintain for a longer period of time. By this means we can keep the device from having too high a localized power dissipation and thus the possibility of thermal runaway. And the device manufacturer usually specifies what that maximum limit is. There is also a limit on the reapplied forward blocking voltage particularly if you're using phase control thyristors and you're trying to switch them more rapidly than they're really intended to be. Because what could happen is you still have some anode current flowing. It may be quite small compared to the peak values that you had, but if there is still anode current flowing, that means there's still stored charge in the two base regions, the uh, base regions of the PNP and the NPN transistors. So what could happen is if the device tries to turn on too quickly to the forward blocking state and you have a very large DVF by DT, you're going to then have the anode current go positive and perhaps decay down toward zero. This would be called a forward recovery. Not only is that dangerous in the sense that it may mean more power dissipation because you're talking about fairly high voltages here, it may make the device much easier to turn on accidentally because of the fast rising DVDT. Down here in the lower left hand corner I show that four layer picture and I've highlighted now the space charge capacitance of the J2 junction. If I have a rapidly rising DVDT for between anode and cathode, I'm going to have current coming through the capacitor and then into the base region of the NPN transistor. That current is in, indistinguishable from a purposely applied gate current. So the combination of some stored charge already in the base still remaining plus a substantial current contribution because of CDVDT might be sufficient to turn the device on when you don't want it to be on. So one must carefully look at and control the rate of rise of that uh, reapplied forward blocking voltage. An easy way or an approximate way of looking at the magnitude of this is 
if the capacitance times dV dt exceeds the breakover current, the device may possibly turn on. And so the maximum dV dt you can have is the breakover current over the approximate value of the space charge capacitance. Typical values of dV dt range from a few hundred volts per microsecond for slow phase control thyristors to several thousand volts per microsecond for inverter grade thyristors. There are ways that the manufacturer can improve the DIDT and DVDT ratings. For the DIDT rating, what one can do is shorten the distance between the center line of the gate electrode and the center line of the adjacent cathode electrode because that means there's a lot less distance that the plasma or the excess carrier cloud has to spread before it completely fills the cathode area. And that's the reason then for the highly interdigitated cathode structure. Something else that can be done is to increase the current coming into the gate without having to have a uh, fairly high power trigger circuit is to use what is called a pilot thyristor. The pilot thyristor is connected to the main thyristor as indicated with the uh, anode of the pilot thyristor connected to the anode of the main thyristor and the uh, cathode connected to the gate of the main thyristor, that is the cathode of the pilot thyristor. So we inject a smaller gate current to the pilot thyristor, turn it on, and it in turn provides large gate currents to the uh, pilot, to the main thyristor to turn it on more rapidly without having to have a fairly beefy drive circuit. In order for this device to turn off, we must provide a path for negative gate current out of the main thyristor, and that's the function of the diode, which is shown, connecting the gate of the main thyristor to the gate of the pilot thyristor. So this allows the negative gate current to flow, which will be helpful in perhaps speeding up the turn off of the main thyristor. As far as improving the VDT, that is the reapplied forward voltage, we can do the following. Here again I show the picture showing the uh, current flowing through the uh, depletion layer capacitance and contributing to the possibility of turn on. And what we do is we shunt away that current by means of cathode shorts. So here I show a cathode short on the opposite side of where the electrode is, I mean where the uh, capacitance is, but since this is a distributed capacitance, there's also a capacitance here. And so by this means, we bypass the P2 region, the base of the NPN transistor with this cathode short. And thus we increase the DVDT rating substantially. The way we can implement cathode shorts is we have many areas where we have gate uh, electrodes connected to the P2 layer and cathode electrodes connected to the N2 layer. In some of these regions, we purposely take the cathode metallization and extend it onto the P2 layer, thus implementing the cathode shorts. We don't do it for every region because we want uh, most of the uh, gates to be isolated and not uh, have the possibility of current being drawn through the gate and not uh, going to the uh, cathode regions, but by doing this we can substantially increase the DVDT ratings. All right, finally we need to talk briefly about how we drive the thyristor. The gate cathode terminals essentially are a PN junction, and we are forward biasing that PN junction when we apply gate current and putting extra electrons and holes into the base region of the NPN transistor. And I guess the uh, didn't take, there we go. So what I'm showing here is the uh, gate voltage as a function of the gate current. This is the IV characteristic of a PN junction in a forward bias direction. I've simply interchanged gate current and uh, gate voltage, so that's voltage on the vertical axis and current on the horizontal, whereas in before we were talking about diodes, that's the current that's on the vertical and the voltage on the horizontal. 
at low temperatures, typically specified at minus 50 or minus 55 degrees centigrade. We have this upper curve for that junction. It takes more voltage to get a given amount of current at low temperatures. At the maximum operating temperature, typically 125 degrees centigrade, that's this lower curve that I'm showing at the maximum temperature line. And we have two other boundaries. There is a locus of minimum firing points down here near the origin. That is the minimum combination of gate to cathode voltage and gate current that is necessary to guarantee that the device will turn on. You, in general, you want to operate well to the right of that so that you have uh, enough voltage and current capability to turn the device on substantially faster than you would if you were down near this locus of minimum firing points. At the other extreme, there is a maximum power dissipation that the uh, junction can handle, and that's labeled maximum gate power dissipation, and that's up here. And so all of this shaded area between the locus of minimum firing points and maximum power dissipation is legitimate operating points for your trigger circuit. I've shown here a typical load line for a gate current circuit and as long as it's to the right of the minimum locus of the locus of minimum firing points and to the left of the power dissipation limit the region as it traverses through this region of operating points you have a good circuit for driving a device typically you might be somewhat closer to the maximum power point than you are the minimum locus minimum firing point locus because you want to have the device turn on fairly quickly and that requires large gate currents. A typical gate current pulse is shown here and it must be maintained for a minimum duration, typically several tens of microseconds for a high power thyristor before it latches on. And so you need to look on the, trend, on the specification sheet for the thyristor as to exactly what that uh, minimum gate current pulse time is and you must be able to provide that in order to guarantee that the thyristor turns on every time you expect it to. That's about as far as I think we will uh, cover the discussion of thyristor operation. The next subject we're going to take up is gate turnoff thyristors, which are a modification of the basic thyristor that enables the gate to turn the thyristor off. Thank you for your attention.